I must start in the same vein as Ronald. You know, I look forward to this occasion, but like you, I'm devastated and traumatized by the tragedy of what happened in Pittsburgh. And we have to face up to it that these days, all of us here have to be on our guard, whether we're in the United States or France or in England. So I feel that deeply, but I'm going to try and cheer us up by saying something to you to start off with about the early difficult years in the relationship between Herzl and the Rothschild family. So please bear with me for a bit of history. Herzl was described by Stefan Zweig in his wonderful memoir, which many of you would have read, The World of Yesterday, as the first man of international stature whom I'd met in my life. Not that I knew what great change he would bring to the destiny of the Jewish people and the history of our times. Now tonight, you've honored our family with the Herzl Prize, but I can't help wondering, at least to start off with, if he would have, would have approved. When Herzl became convinced that a Jewish state was a world necessity, he set out to obtain the support of the Rothschilds, asking them to contribute both their standing and their money. He went so far as to propose that the first elected doge of the republic would be a Rothschild. He wrote his essay uh, to the Rothschild family in a fervor of passion, weeping frequently during the process. And his friend, Dr. Emil Schiff, reacted by saying that Rothschild would probably consider the scheme mad, so much so that the Baron might ring his brother, ordering him to deliver Herzl either to the police or to an asylum. <clears throat> But Herzl uh, didn't give up. He approached Baron Edmond, Baron Edmond de Rothschild from France, who'd supported the resettlement of persecuted Jews from Russia to Palestine. And the Baron's response was, it would be impossible to control the influx of the masses into Palestine. The first to arrive would be 150,000 beggars. And they would have to be fed in all probability by me. And Herzl was so upset that he wrote, if a society of Jews cannot be formed through the aristocrats of money, it will be formed through the Democrats of money, and we shall let in all Jews except for the Rothschilds. <laughs> <laughs> so, got off to a bad start. But after many years, both uh, Baron Edmond de Rothschild and my ancestor, Lord Rothschild, in England, were one round. And the Baron, in his old age, declared, and I take it slightly with a pinch of salt, without us, he said, the Zionists could have done nothing. <clears throat> without the Zionists, I should have failed. Those who think my whole intention was to find several settlements in Israel are small-minded. I knew very well from the beginning that my whole aim was that the work I was doing would eventually lead to the establishment of the Jewish state. I think he was going a bit far. <laughs> Anyhow, Herzl and the Baron came to share a single objective, the redemption of Israel and the rebirth of the Jewish nation in the historic land. So I feel not too bad that if Fetzel was looking down on us, he might not have disapproved of your choice. You've been incredibly generous <clears throat> in honoring our family tonight. But great, too, has been the opportunity given, us to, given to us to play a part in the extraordinary story of Israel. A bit of history, if I may. I mean, Baron Edmond's vision and his work were carried on by his son, Jimmy, who came, a picture of him up there, who came to live in England after witnessing the anti-Semitism around the Dreyfus case in Paris. 
And both he and his wife, Dolly, were unswerving in their support of Heim Weizmann, leading up to the Balfour Declaration in November 1917, being addressed to the second Lord Rothschild as head of the British Zionist Federation. Shortly before he died, Jimmy promised to provide the funds for the Knesset. You can see the building there, the building in Jerusalem, which most of you will know. And he wrote to Prime Minister Ben-Gurion that the building should become a symbol in the eyes of all men of the permanence of the State of Israel. And his widow, Dolly, made a lasting contribution after his lifetime to Israel society through the philanthropy which is called Yad Hanadiv and which she founded. She entrusted me with its chairmanship. Family continuity is assured through my daughter Hannah. My nephew James, where is he? He's happily here tonight <clears throat> and living in New York. And then we have my French cousin Beatrice, all exemplary trustees. Two of our non-family trustees who've helped us so, so much over the years are here tonight. Where's my great friend Jim Wolfenson? Over there. <clears throat> <clears throat> our families go back 100 years. I won't go into that story now, but it's true. <laughs> and then we have the irrepressible Arthur Siegel, where's he, who makes all our meetings fun. <laughs> Not only fun, but also serious. <clears throat> Let me say, however, it was the work and vision of three distinguished directors of Yad Hanadiv, Max Rowe, who is sadly no longer with us, Arthur Freed. Now, is Arthur here? Where is he? I, I, I hoped he was here. And Ariel Weiss, they made, frankly, our work possible. I think it's fair to say the foundation has touched virtually every citizen of Israel through the establishment of institutions such as the Center for Educational Technology, the Open University, the Institute for Advanced Studies, Abney Russia, the Institute for School Leadership, and the Jerusalem Music Center. And then we have one in Europe now, the Rothschild Foundation Hanadi, which is inspirationally led by a good lady who can't be with us tonight, Sally Berkowitz, who's made a real difference to Jewish academic and cultural life in Europe. It was my late cousin Dolly's idea to offer a new home for Israel's Supreme Court, which you can see there. And today we're engaged in the creation and construction of a new national library beautiful building by Jacques Herzog of Herzog de Muren. <clears throat> Having lunch with him tomorrow. <laughs> I'll tell him it's well received. It will be a library without borders for people of all faiths with links to Jewish communities throughout the world and made possible by the cyber revolution of today. Now look, I've described the work of Yad Hanadiv but frankly, I've been involved with it for more than 50 years. But I'm also deeply conscious of the commitment of my cousins in France, represented tonight by David, chairman of the governing board of the World Jewish Congress. <laughs> Eric couldn't make it tonight, his cousin, my cousin, a path, but he was been a path maker in recognizing the needs of Israel's poorest population, the Bedouins. <laughs> and Eric's sister, some of you may know, saintly lady, Beatrice, has done so much. For example, supporting the ghetto fighters' kibbutz in northern Israel, founded by Holocaust survivors. And then I'd also, well, more than mention, the work of the Edmond de Rothschild Foundation, which is led by my cousin Benjamin de Rothschild and his wife Ariane, who carry out some 35 programs, opening up opportunities for approximately 30,000 young people in Israel each year, and in providing access to higher education, particularly 
but vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. <clears throat> Now, it's eight generations since our family left the Frankfurt ghetto, that's the house over there, over 200 years ago. And you can see that many members of our family remain involved and committed to Israel and Jewish communities in Europe. Now, on a very different note, <clears throat> enough about the Rothschilds and their history, your chairman wrote a frank and deeply felt piece in the New York Times recently. And I think it's timely to remind ourselves of the principles enshrined first in the Balfour Declaration and then in Israel's Declaration of Independence. And let me quote briefly from the Balfour Declaration, although it's only 967 words. Nothing, I'm going to give you 67. Nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non Jewish communities in Palestine. And then Israel's Declaration of Independence affirmed that the state will ensure complete equality of social and polit political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. Now, if you look back again at great men who shaped the history of Israel and what it is today, we surely treasure Prime Minister Rabin's speech, particularly at the White House 25 years ago. And I'll just quote you a little bit of that, because it's so moving. We say to you, the Palestinians today, in a loud and clear voice, enough of blood and tears. Enough. We have no desire for revenge. We harbor no hatred towards you. We, like you, are people who want to build a home, to plant a tree, to love, to live side by side with you in dignity, in empathy, as human beings, as free men. Now, 2,000 years of Jewish history and the 36 occasions on which the Hebrew Bible enjoins us to love the stranger add inspiration and weight to our moral and historical imperative. I'm sure all of us in this room revere Israel as a democratic state whose economy is one of the most advanced in the world. <clears throat> our loyalties remain unimpaired even when there are differences with the political leadership of the day. Now, I'd like to end my brief remarks with some words of gratitude. First, uh, to Herzl, who laid the foundations of the State of Israel. He made the impossible happen after 2,000 years. And in doing so, he changed the, literally changed the history of the world and gave us hope. As David Wolfson said in his eulogy, Herzl's name will remain sacred and unforgotten for long as a single Jew lives on this earth. So our family, thanks to you, Ronald, and members of the World Jewish Congress, for a really signal and extraordinary honor. There could be no greater compliment than to have our family's name linked to the sacred name of Herzl through your prize. Thank you very much.